During the Great Depression, I worked closely with the organizations that shared my pro-union ideology and supported workers' rights. Among these organizations was the Booker T. Washington Trade Association, or the BTWTA, the Civic Rights Committee, the Communist Party, and later the United Automobile Workers. The BTWTA encouraged the black community to patronize existing black businesses. The Civic Rights Committee attacked businesses that had discriminatory hiring practices and encouraged boycotts on businesses that would not hire blacks. The Communist Party was a strong supporter of the Congress of Industrial Organization, a group focused on organizing all industrial workers, regardless of trade, skill, race, gender, nationality, and religion. Unlike the American Federation of Labor, which only organized skilled trades, the CIO was all-inclusive and therefore beneficial for the African-American community and the goals of the Communist Party. In an effort to unionize the automobile industry, the CIO organized United Auto Workers to support the fight for workers' rights. I received criticism for my anti-Ford views, opening my church to union meetings and my affiliation with the Communist Party. In the 1940s, my increasing concerns of church company alliances like Second Baptist and Ford Motor Company were confirmed during a UAW sit-down strike at the Ford River Rouge plant. In April 1941, the UAW conducted this strike after nine employees were fired for being in the union. Ford Motor Company was the last automotive company to negotiate with the UAW. The relationship that Henry Ford established with local black church leaders allowed him a constant stream of anti-union workers, demobilizing the fight for workers' rights. As chairman of the Civic Rights Committee since 1938, I became very involved in the sit-down strike and worked with the UAW in the fight for black equality. The strike became the turning point in the UAW-Ford relationship. My participation solidified my UAW involvement and compelled me to act in other public protests. In 1942, the government created a public housing project for African-American auto workers and their families called the Sojourner Truth Homes. Whites protested because the project was built in an all-white neighborhood. The government decided not to open the projects because of the neighborhood response. I, along with other civil rights and labor leaders, formed the Sojourner Truth Citizens Committee to demand that the government use the project as it was originally intended. Through our efforts, the government decided to reopen the project and allow black families to move in. The night before the move, the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross in front of the project site. That morning, white rioters attacked and overturned the cars of the families attempting to move in. The UAW came to our aid, demanding that families receive police protection and that the FBI investigate the KKK. When the United States entered World War II, I started the Citizens Committee for Jobs and War Industry and received a lot of support from the UAW. The committee worked together with black union leaders like Shelton Tapps and Horace Sheffield to request that public hearings be held to address the discriminatory hiring practices at Ford. During wartime, there were very few black women working in Ford's plants. At the Willow Creek plant, there were no black women at all. The local 600 demanded that Paul McNutt, chairman of the War Manpower Commission, or the WMC, enforced the anti-discrimination policies that the UAW held with Ford, while the Citizens Committee demanded the same of the Fair Employment Practices Committee, the FEPC. Neither Ford, the WMC, nor the FEPC adhered to our efforts. On November 20th, I led an interracial delegation to Washington, D.C., where all parties met with the War Policy Division to discuss the discriminatory practices in Detroit. Two weeks later, Paul McNutt agreed to hold hearings in Detroit and Ford began to hire black women. When McNutt canceled the hearings, we organized a march down Woodward Avenue to Cadillac Square. UAW Vice President Walter Ruther, myself and others spoke out against discrimination in war plants. I continued to work with the UAW and the NAACP on race issues like the 1943 race riot. Wanting to ensure more equality in Detroit, I ran for civil council in 1945, 1947, 1948, and 1949, but false accusations destroyed my chances of being elected. With the rise of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement in the 1950s, relations between the UAW and the black community began to wither. In the midst of all the upheaval in Detroit, I bought a house on West Grand Boulevard, finally able to move my family out of my childhood home. To escape the stresses of the city, in 1951, we bought land in Harbor Beach, Michigan. 
We often invited friends and members of the congregation to join us on our annual retreats. After many years of service to my church and my community, I retired in 1969. Reverend Hill's involvement in the labor movement was influential to the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. He formed strong ties with civil rights leaders who continually fought for equal rights and the preservation of freedom. Reverend Charles Hill passed away on February 8, 1970, at the age of 77.